second iteration of new faculty micro talks. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Jeffrey Center for the Humanities and the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Uh, our dean says his, sends his apologies. There is another event that has drawn him away. So he will not be here, but I see we have representatives from the dean's office. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I'm particularly pleased to have started this event because um, it brings together faculty from lots of different departments across the college um, and allows us to see all the new faces and get excited about the future of UMBC. So um, I'm, I'm very happy that um, you're all here and that we can welcome these fabulous new faculty. Um, so let me just tell you quickly about the format of the new faculty micro talks if you weren't here in the fall. Um, we have given each um, faculty person five minutes to talk um, and we've asked them to talk a little bit off the cuff as though they were talking to non-experts in their field um, because of course they are. Um, and, and so uh, th these are not job talks and they are not paper presentations so um, we're hoping that this will be somewhat informal. Uh, we'll go in alphabetical order, that in, that's the order that was on the flyer that I sent around. Um, we'll, we have eight speakers, so I will introduce the first four. We will have the first four speak, and then we will have five minutes or so for questions for those first four, and then I'll introduce the second four and let them speak, and then we'll have Q&A at the end, and this will be take about an hour, all told. Eight, eight scholars in an hour, pretty good. Um, <laughs> All right, so without further ado, our first speaker is Malada Bellin. She's assistant professor in Africana Studies and English. She came here in the fall of 2014 from uh, teaching in the Duke in New York Arts and Media program. Before that, she was in a postdoc in English at uh, Rutgers, and her PhD is from Duke. Our second speaker is Steph Sarasso, who is also an assistant professor in English, who came in the fall of 2014. Um, she was teaching at Georgetown for a year before she came to UMBC, and her PhD is from the University of Pittsburgh. Erin Hogan is assistant professor in MLLI, and she came in the fall of 2013. She, her uh, PhD is from UCLA in Spanish. Michael Lane is assistant professor in ancient studies who began in fall 2014. Hogan is coming back. Um, and before that, he was a visiting assistant professor last year and an adjunct from 2008 to 2013. So he's not as new as, <laughs> as the other new faculty, but, but, but new as an assistant professor. Um, he's also the director of archaeological field work in Greece since 2010. So uh, I'm going to invite Malada to come up and get us started. Well, thank you for the introduction, Jessica, and thank you all for being here. I'm excited to talk a little bit about my work. So I work on 20th century African American literature, 21st century literature of the African diaspora, genre, and spatial theory. And I'm currently working on a book project that explores the fantastic and black authored narrative. And one of the things I'm thinking through is the ways in which representations of the unreal, the speculative, and the uncanny are always bound up for black writers in spatial practice and the phenomenology of space. Uh, and that furthermore, in, in the text I'm looking at, uh, which cover a, a broad spectrum from the beginning of the 20th century up through the 21st, uh, the fantastic is a way for these writers to reimagine social space at historical moments when physical spaces, geographical spaces, are either unavailable or uninhabitable. Um, so uh, one example, I'm working with um, a serial novel uh, by Pauline Hopkins from the turn of the 20th century uh, by the name of, um, of One Blood or the Hidden Self. And one of the things that happens in this text is that the fantastic in the form of occultism actually collapses the geographical distance between Africa and North America, and it transforms um, knowledge about Africa into this interior kind of psychic knowing that reorients uh, the black, the collective black cultural imaginary at the turn of the 20th century toward a pan-Africanist ethos. So the fantastic is a way for Hopkins to make this geographic and um, collective cultural turn. 
Um, in one of the post-war short stories that I'm looking at by Ralph Ellison, The King of the Bingo Game, a different version of the fantastic, a kind of sound, um, does a similar type of spatial work. And in that text, it's a scream that reoccurs in that text that cuts across time, history, and also uh, the spatial logic of the pre-civil rights urban north. Um, so I started, this is a, a evolving out of my dissertation, and so I started by thinking about the fantastic in the work of black writers as an engagement <coughs> and also a resistance to the supernatural. And I was really interested in that tension uh, between kind of moving toward and away from. And I believe that it has something to do with what is uh, both an explicit and implicit commitment on the part of black writers to engage with the social real as a means of addressing a historical marginalization of black people. Um, and it's a commitment that would seem to preclude the fantastic. So what I'm thinking about here is a writer like Toni Morrison, um, who you know very much resists the label of magical realism, right, and insists that that somehow deauthenticates her work, right. Um, and so, despite what Morrison and others have to say, and despite the fact that it's not always named as the fantastic in the, in, in many works, it does actually proliferate in African American literature because it's this intermediary space, right? Not quite real, not quite unreal, but harboring uh, both kind of moods at the same time. So it's that it's that indeterminacy, that instability, uh, that really interests me because I think that it. Uh, captures or encapsulates this desire to not just critique, but also to actually reconfigure the racial and the spatial order of things. And in the works of 21st century black writers, this becomes increasingly important because uh, the spatial or order is becoming more and more the milieu in which ideologies of race are reproduced. Uh, so uh, in thinking about the fantastic and also thinking about its relationship to blackness, one of the things that I'm also doing is thinking about <coughs> blackness and duality, blackness and the fantastic. Uh, and I'm working uh, with some of the ideas of the late scholar Richard Eiten, who refers to the black fantastic as pleonasm or double descriptive. Um, and that's just another way of thinking about this sense of doubling and the sense of moving away and moving toward the real, right? Uh, that is necessitated by bearing witness and testimony, but also very much re resisting the structure of the real as the very parameters that reproduce identity and race, right? So that one has to both. Um, critique them, but then also kind of resist the frame in which they're being critiqued at the same time, right? So the fantastic is um, is what I'm beginning to see as the as one of the primary modes in which this type of work can be done. Uh, so for all these reasons, uh, uh, many of the much black author writing contains elements or strange shadows of the unreal, uh, and always at the point at which space is being articulated, right? Space is being practiced or represented. Uh, so it's a spatial imaginary, and the spatial imaginary manifests as a desire to master space, to author space, uh, to reimagine space. It manifests, in, uh, speci especially in the later works, in meditations on spatial deprivation, in representations of listening as map making, and in dreams about space and its social, political, cultural, and bodily manifestations. So all of these different themes and modes of expression, what I consider spatial narrations of being and belonging, channel the fantastic in these texts in various forms. Um, the last thing I'll say is that uh, the, the direction I'm moving in now is really thinking about sound and scale. Uh, and what I've begun to realize in terms of thinking about the fantastic is that it's really uh, sound that kind of triggers that spatial move and also the way in which sound and scale are interrelated that kind of serves as this grammar of the fantastic. So I'm looking at um, songs, screams, musical recordings, but also the ways in which sound echoes and how that reproduces and produces uh, spatial practices. Uh, so that this idea of this nexus of space and phantasm that I'm uh, continually re revisiting um, is very much, especially in 21st century black writing, catalyzed by sound. For that one. Um, so this is actually a great Hi. segue uh, because I also do work on sound. Um, I'm currently working on a book project that reimagines listening education for the 21st century. Um, and I have a little book teaser, it's a minute long, so I'm just going to play that and then I'll sort of give an overview of the project as a whole. How has our digital connectedness changed the ways we learn to listen to the world around us? 
What have we gained or lost by incessantly listening to sound through earbuds and tiny computer speakers? How should we be teaching students to be sensitive, thoughtful listeners in the 21st century? In a culture where being plugged into digital devices is the norm, when so much of what we pay attention to is streaming through earbuds or flashing on screens, I'm calling for a re-education of our senses, a bodily retraining that can help us learn to become more open to the connections among sensory modes, materials, and environments. In addition to listening in to digital content, it's time that we learn to listen up, out, through, and around. Um, so listening is rarely approached as a practice that involves more than our ears. Right? <coughs> Even when we're taught to listen, we learn to concentrate um, and make meaning of audible words or sounds. And even the technologies that we interact with, smartphones, iPods, tablets, reinforce ear-centric listening habits. We plug earbuds into digital devices and crank up the volume to immerse ourselves in our own private sonic bubbles. By encouraging people to ignore the larger sonic environment around them, such technologies play a role in training listeners to develop selective listening habits. While I don't think that digital technologies are inherently good or bad for our listening practices, um, they do have an effect on the ways that we're conditioned to listen. So we've, we've learned to treat sound as content to consume as opposed to something that influences our embodied experiences. So considering the various ways that digital technologies have changed listeners' relationship to sound, this moment in time calls for a listening education that takes into account the kinds of sonic habits and experiences that have emerged in recent years. So the challenge for teachers is this. How can we teach students to cultivate relevant listening practices that allow them to capitalize on the use of sound in digital contexts while retraining them to become attentive, savvy listeners in any setting? My book project provides a collection of possibilities for teaching students to be more sensitive listeners in relation to digital media and in their everyday lives. In response to widespread plug-in and tune-out listening habits, I attempt to expand how we think about and practice listening as a situated, full-bodied act, um, not just something that we do with our ears. Developing a heightened sensitivity to how sound can influence our embodied experiences <coughs> is necessary because sound is playing an increasingly important role in the text, products, and environments that we interact with and create. Um, so in a range of everyday settings, sound is being used strategically to influence our moods and behaviors, and I argue that tapping into these strategies can help students create more effective and dynamic multimodal projects or digital work. And the pedagogy I introduce is based on my concept of multimodal listening, um, which is a practice that involves attending to the sensory, material, and contextual aspects of a sonic event. So unlike ear-centric listening practices, multimodal listening focuses on the ecological relationship between sound, bodies, and environments. It entails developing an awareness of how sound shapes and is shaped by different spaces, material objects, and embodied multisensory experiences. So in short, rather than homing in on a specific sound, it asks listeners to approach sonic interactions holistically. And the framework for my pedagogy is based on techniques from a different <coughs> mix of sound professionals. So one chapter deals with a deaf percussionist, Evelyn Clunny. Um, the the, another deals with acoustic designers who design the sound for buildings or different spaces. And the last chapter deals with product designers who design sound for everything from cars to cereal. And in each chapter, I explore how these professionals listen and compose, and then I show how adopting their practices can be used to develop a more robust pedagogy for listening um, <laughs> in classrooms that deal with media production. So my hope is that multimodal listening pedagogy will lead to fresh, expansive approaches to the teaching of listening, both in my own field, um, as well as across the disciplines, from sound studies to art and design to the digital humanities more broadly. Um, so that's the five minute version. <laughs> I will be happy to <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Eric. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Professor of Spanish and MLLI. 
and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research now. Can you talk into the mic? Mike, Mike yes. My research focuses on the child in cinema, child and literature as well. So I look at the representations of child protagonists in films from Spain and Latin America. I particularly look at the political use of these child protagonists and child characters in the films. And I primarily look at films from Spain, but I'm also expanding into films from Latin America. Um, these films are contemporary, but they are also retrospective. So they're retrospective of military regimes in these countries. My book project examines the cine con niño. So the cine con niño is a genre of Spanish film um, of child with child protagonists. They're child musicals, and they're from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, so the first few decades of Francisco Franco's dictatorship in Spain. And I propose that there is now a new cine con niño. So the first cine con niño was the 40s to the 60s, and I propose that there is a new batch of these films, so from the 70s to today. But really, um, since the 90s, there's been a very um, it's been what I call a bumper crop of these films. And these films that are more recent, of course, after following the dictatorship, look back critically on the dictatorship. So they're from the other side of the coin. Both genres utilize a child <coughs> political ends, but opposing ideologies. I explore similarities and representations across films from Spain and Latin America. Um, and right now I'm focusing on films from Argentina and Chile. When I'm looking at the political use of these child protagonists, I'm looking at subjectivity, gender, sexuality, and also the intertextuality of these films across genres and across um, transatlantically as well. And actually, I have, do have a few images. So up, up top on the left, you see um, a classic film from the Cine Con Niño. Um, so that's from the 60s. And then its counterpart um, from 2002 on the right-hand side, and then on the bottom. Um, another more recent Spanish <coughs> film and its Chilean counterpart on the right-hand side. So my theoretical framework involves, and the overarching concept is that of appropriation. So the historical backdrop of these films, um, particularly now I'm going to speak about the case in Spain, is that um, over 30,000 children were illegally adopted, appropriated by the regime, from Republican par parents and the parents whose side lost the Spanish Civil War, and they were appropriated, adopted by families who were adherent to the regime. Um, this is not very well known in, in the Spanish case. So uh, that is the historical fact behind the appropriation, but I also look at the appropriation of the cine con niño genre. So on the part of the more recent films, I see these films contesting, but also appropriating for their own political uses um, the earlier genre. And I do actually see appropriation um, acted out in terms of ventriloquism in these films. There are ventriloquist characters. There's also this dynamic of the appropriation of the voice and body of the child. Um, and it, it plays out in different forms. Um, so when I look at my metaphorical framework or my metaphorical lens is ventriloquism and my theoretical lens is biopolitics. So the growing incorporation of man's natural life and the mechanisms and calculations of power and I feel like these, I find that these work very well together because ventriloquism really illustrates that appropriation. Why, why, am, I, why am I interested in this and why um, do I think this is important? Well, one is, one fact is, as I mentioned before, that there, there was really an explosion of these films um, in the 90s. And um, in Spain, I explain this in terms of transitional justice, which is not um, taken to task the human rights abuses of the Spanish Civil War and Franco's dictatorship. So I see these films as an effort to adjudicate the crimes of Francoism in the cultural sphere. Um, the new Cine Con Niño reclaims the conventions of the Cine Con Niño, but now for the left, for the losing side. And child appropriations in Spain are much less known compared to those in Argentina. It also surprises me that scholarly criticism of these films um, focus on or denounce the Francoist crimes that we see or the Francoist abuses we see in the films without accounting for the film's own political use of children in order to, to denounce these abuses. <coughs> in terms of other related interests in future projects, you can tell from my metaphorical lens of ventriloquism that I'm interested in the voice in cinema. Um, and I started to work on the cinema of Isela Coixet also for this reason. I look at sound, I look at the voice, human rights, and also interculturality in her film. So getting a away a little bit from the child protagonist, even though I plan to continue um, my study of child protagonists in Latin American cinema. 
That's me this time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got my name right. All right. Five minute challenge. A weak voice. <laughs> Yours is in the folder. It's in the folder. Let's mm -hmm. see if it was open. And... All right, we're off. So I am um, <laughs> assistant professor of Greek archaeology in the Ancient Studies Department. Uh, and I have certain special interests uh, under that title. Uh, to start with, uh, I am interested in agro-pastoral uh, practices of the late Bronze Age Aegean. That is to say, the period from about 1700 down to about 1100 BCE in the territory that now comprises Greece, Crete, the islands and the sea of the same name, and the west coast of Turkey. I'm also interested in cultural landscapes. That is to say, the material traces that people, human beings, leave at various different scales on the surface of the earth as the result of local, culturally informed knowledge, culturally specific knowledge. It also so happens that I read a script that dates to the late Bronze Age and is from the Aegean called Linear B, and it represents the earliest form of the Greek language that we have. Uh, and when reading these texts, I'm particularly interested in how the scribes conceive of space and place, including how they understand culturally things like agro-pastoral practices. So, my, the thrust of my research is to integrate these various interests in order to uh, create heuristic models for further discovering the traces of things like the actual agro-pastoral practices, some of the human or non-human agencies that were actually involved in them, and perhaps the elements that were used in both the context of the text and in the landscape to construct things like social identities. So, a case in point. I took data from the text, namely the way that land is measured in seed corn, and I combined it with evidence from history and ethnographies that explain how people plow land with certain technologies, animal-drawn plows, and how they broadcast seed across the land, especially when they're uh, cultivating very large tracts, to come up with a model of the kinds of land tracts that the palaces in which these texts are archived is interested in. And so I have a framework for how I expect fields to be bounded, their size and their configuration. So what's the next step? The next step is to go find it. So fortunately for me, Greece is dotted with these little rift valleys that accumulate lots of water and with that water sediment. Now this seems, means that they are very wet generally, they're very marshy, but lo, there just so happens to be one in which there is a huge late Bronze Age fortress. And that late Bronze Age fortress is sitting in the midst of land that has been currently drained for agriculture. And even better, when I have a close look at this fortress and the surrounding territory, I realize that the land around it was drained in the late Bronze Age too. And this is a massive place. The scale bar here is 200 meters. And within it are these enormous storerooms. And in one 2,000 square foot uh, room of these storehouses alone, the charred remains of a single species of wheat was found, amounting to or representing about two to 3,000 tons of wheat. So this suggests that the reason they drained the land was to use it for agriculture. So, I started to look in the territory around the fortress, and I used several methods. I used magnetometry, or rather, my colleague Tim Horsley employed a magnetometer to look beneath the surface of the Earth without actually invading it. And we also collected remains off the surface of the ground in a really systematic fashion so that we could map their distribution, their kind, and the ages uh, to which we could date them, uh, and the ages to which we could uh, place them. And, well, what are some of the results? Well, there is a 160 meter scale bar, and lo and behold, within the areas that we subjected to magnetometry, we found something very much like what I expected. To give you an idea of scale, the interval between those two red lines is about 30 meters or about 100 feet. And these seem to represent uh, 
levees with canals running alongside them and feeder canals coming in. And we can actually trace this from outside the areas we sample with a magnetometer. Using satellite data, we can continue to see these alignments pass through the Earth and the effect that they have, through the effect that they have on the vegetation uh, above them. Uh, we also got some loot, although we don't call it loot in my business, but we have some nice stuff from the surface, so the kind of thing you might generally associate with archaeology. I was able to date these things. This is a slide which lends itself to the joke of the links that archaeologists will go to get a date. Um, so we cored into them, had a look at them, got samples out, and I would have been happy with a 3,200-year-old date. I had to settle for a 3,700-year-old date, but these are firmly in the Late Bronze Age. So it seemed to confirm my expectations. In the interest of open access, we made all of the data available online, so there's a website here. And in fact, we created a geographic information system uh, portal in which you can actually click on objects uh, on the screen, and it will take you to uh, an image, a database that shows you what was found, how many, what period it dates to, and so forth, and gives you a very precise location for the surface finds. Okay, very briefly then, uh, future plans, well, immediately this summer, I'm going to be returning. I'm going to be taking some further samples that are going to be subjected to some very special analyses, which should be able to help me refine the chronology, and in fact, determine whether it's perhaps a little bit higher than I should expect for a reason, local environmental reasons. Uh, and I'm also going to start to begin procedures for surveying the flora and fauna of the area so that I have something to compare the environmental proxies I hope to recover in the future uh, in order to, re uh, to reconstruct uh, ancient environments. And I'll end on this note in the interest of time. This general approach of integrating textual information with, ev with the evidence from the ground is applicable in other contexts. So, for example, recently I've been completing a paper with a former UMBC student, Jared Farmer, in which I'm looking at a very different scale of analysis. I'm looking at the late Bronze Age palaces themselves, right, the architectural constructions, and trying to be able to impute agency there, the kinds of people who would have inhabited that space, and how they would have performed in that space using the method that I've described to you there, populating it with actors, populating it with furniture, and having them move through the space in uh, a way that uh, is, explains the sort of ceremony that's described in one of the texts. And then finally, I hope to be taking the same basic method and using the, create the sort of topographic model I described, perhaps a little bit more elaborate, to understand the practices of livestock husbandry that the palaces of the late Bronze Age are engaged in. Draw a line under it there. Thank you very much. Pause for questions as promised, and just fortuitously, I think there's some overlaps and synergies. So, you know, um, who would like to ask a question? <coughs> uh, ask a question. View. I'm really surprised, but perhaps you're yeah. deliberately avoiding Pan's Labyrinth as a film. Um, there. It's a, that's a good point, Brooke. Yeah. I'm not avoiding it. Mm -hmm. um, it's the four that came out of the new crop of films, to an agricultural metaphor for you there. Um, and I think it's very interesting. I also think that it skirts a number of issues, which is um, also why it's interesting. Please keep in mind, I don't know yeah. the genre by that, yeah, so, yeah, by that yeah. name, but well, I thought my well, it's the first thing popped in my head. Yeah, it's a good example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know you were saying, I'm sorry. No, no, it's, right. it's a good example right. of um, telling the story of the Spanish Civil War and the years after, but from the other perspective, right? right? I should say that Steph and Malada are talk, both talking about sound. They're the, new lead, the leaders of our new faculty working group in the college on sound studies. Mm -hmm. So if anybody else is interested in sound, <laughs> you could join. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For uh, one of my colleagues in English, Malada, yes. uh, whose definition of the fantastic do you use, or, or more specifically even, does the definition of the fantastic, does it, is it evolving as you are looking at how it's bound up with 
representations of space, constructions of space. Is, is it a stable static definition of the fantastic in your view? No, it's not or stable or static. Um, so I, I started out by using um, Todorov's definition, right? right? And so mm -hmm. that kind of way of thinking about the fantastic as always in between this real and unreal, right? And isolating the pure fantastic as the space in which it becomes impossible to differentiate between those two zones. So that was the specific right. way in which I moored myself. But I, but I do not find that it's stable at all, mm -hmm. especially since I'm looking at texts where uh, the fantastic is not necessarily visible at the surface level, right? And so it's triggered through this particular kind of relationship uh, with space and sound. All right, well, we will move on. And if you have questions or, or conversation um, for later over the reception, that's fine. Um, so our next speaker is Kathy Marmor, who is an associate professor of visual arts, who started that position in spring 2014. Um, but she was visiting at UMBC in 2012. Um, she came to us from the University of Vermont, where she was also associate professor. Uh, Gary Rosons is assistant professor in visual arts. He started at UMBC in fall 2013. Prior to that, he taught at Columbia College Chicago, and his MFA is from the University of Arizona. Speaking next will be Dina Smith, Assistant Professor of Sociology and Anthropology, who started at UMBC in fall 2014. Prior to that, she taught at Goucher for three years, and her degree is from Rutgers in Sociology. And finally, Colin Studs, who's Assistant Professor in Geography and Environmental Systems, who came to UMBC in fall 2013. And he came to UMBC following a postdoc in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. So, Kathy? Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to say how delighted I am to have this opportunity to actually share my work with you tonight. And what I'm going to do this evening is actually to show some pieces that for me reflect the evolution of my artistic practice. So I began my career as a performance artist. Um, and um, the piece that I'm showing you now, or the performance that I'm showing you now, is a, a work that came from a series of uh, pieces called Kitchen Science. Um, and in this performance, what I do is I lead, um, I, I lead people to in extracting, oops, I lost my slide. Um, I lead people in extracting uh, DNA from wheat germ using a common household uh, in, in ingredients and uh, equipment. The performance, like many of my earlier performances, um, was really informed by my experiences as a corporeal being. In the 1990s, my work was actually influenced by um, uh, artists like Camille uh, Utterback, who started to use the computer as a medium. And in this work, uh, Ed er uh, Utterback created digital video projections that the viewer could interact with by using their body. Um, I found this form of interaction really interesting, and consequently, I started to actually uh, create my own interactive installations. Um, and what I was really interested in doing was um, making pieces that focused on the viewer's body and their physical actions with the work. I wanted the viewer to really be, um, to be actually an aware performer. Um, the handling the measuring spoons, as you can see in this piece called The Origins of Life, for me really emphasized the content of the work. Um, and I was really interested in grappling with uh, the <coughs> social and political implications of using cooking as a metaphor for scientific processes. However, um, uh, my work developed, uh, however my work as my work developed and as the technology uh, became more sophisticated and um, more uh, 
easily acquired or sort of more accessible, I found that actually the predominance of the body in my work started to change a lot. Um, and in this piece, what happens is that the fans are actually triggered um, by a, a sensor detector when either someone or something walks by. And then finally, in my most current interactive work, which is called The Messengers, a text message actually replaces the viewer's physical interaction um, with the work and underscores my contention that the, the person is uh, sort of tangential to the phone. Um, uh, the, the spinning forms, the spinning fans are a chorus of performers who comment via Twitter on text messages sent to them. So in 2010, I was diagnosed with leukemia, and this is the wig that I wear when all my hair fell out from the chemotherapy. Um, so it's definitely true that my body completely surprised me, and my whole life was upended by this disease. Um, so during my recovery, what I did is I started to create a number of digital collages that um, for me uh, sort of continued this notion of the dissolution of the body that I had been thinking about when I created the messengers. Uh, the collages that I made are actually um, just images that I had taken off of the internet. And um, for, um, that they're very similar um, in point to the messengers because the machines and the messengers are these really smart machines that I make them do very, very dumb things. And so these images um, that I, were, I was creating for me um, also sort of came back to the point of, um, of, uh, of the paradox as well and the fact that they're full of promise and possibility, um, but they're also kind of a little uncertain and really useless. Um, so each of these pieces that are in this series uh, personifies a distinct technological epoch. And what I often do is I create these digital sketches and kind of drawings or prints as I call them in order to work out new ideas before I go into making an interactive world. So this gets me into really current work. These are sets of prints that I'm right now kind of working with and trying to figure out. Um, so this series um, it deals with um, uh, some de the deaths that I had in my family. Um, in 2012, my brother passed away unexpectedly. And then in, um, six months later, my dad um, passed away through a lingering illness. Um, and so what I decided to do in my father's case was I digitally altered these handkerchiefs that he had in the, while he was in the nursing home, and I made them look, uh, take the form of a beating heart. And my plan is to um, frame them by using pages of the, the great books of the Western world that my father bequeathed me. And then this final image is, of course, of my brother. Um, the last, um, for me, these images uh, speak of my family's disintegration. The objects that I've used and are created are manifestations of my father and my brother's presence. And um, for me, they're rec representations of this kind of reckoning of loss that I've had. Um, so in the end, I just wanted to invite you to the faculty exhibition that's happening in the fall because I'll have a chance to actually show the new prints that I've been working on. So just again, to refresh your memory, my name is Gary Rosantz, and I'm an assistant professor of graphic design in the visual arts department. Um, so my current research interests lie in determining the core competencies required for entry-level um, web designers. So in May 2014, my grant proposal, web designer, 
competency inventory and recommendations for inclusion in design curricula um, developed in support of my research was awarded the AIGA Design Faculty Research Grant. Uh, my subsequent research includes an upcoming podcast series with web design practitioners to determine, uh, contextualize, and prioritize these competencies and a series of web design pedagogy articles, one of which is what I'm presenting today. So there have been radical changes in how we communicate as a society in the past 10 years. Uh, in 2005, Twitter didn't exist. Facebook was barely a year old. WordPress was only two years old. Flickr was a year old. Um, YouTube had just been born in 2005, and Instagram won't be developed for another five years. So additionally, in 2005, the New York Times started charging $49.95 for select online access to its newspaper and eliminated 190 jobs due to declining readership. Snowfall, the groundbreaking article forever changing um, online reading experiences was still seven years from its debut. So the Arab Spring uprising, unlike past conflicts, was not supported through a guerrilla print or word campaign. Unlike past conflicts, I mean, so rather a sophisticated social media onslaught helped connect and empower rebels to overthrow a brutal regime. Today, politicians <coughs> regularly fall from grace, not due to their policy and legislation choices, but because of misuse of media outlets not available in 2005. Did this guy ring a bell? <laughs> so furthermore, the, the black and blue um, and gold and white dress phenomenon that recently took shape is a perfect example of the new form of digital communications um, as well as the efforts to maintain net neutrality that are that we're now uh, being accustomed to that weren't available seven years ago so the driving force behind this shift can be found in the changes to devices used to communicate newspaper television and radio were the dominant forms of disseminating communications and they still are for Lindsey Graham, until personal computing devices became popular. But the true game changer, the smartphone, <coughs> came in 2007. So with the release of the iPhone, how people accessed and distributed communications radically changed. Today, smartphones are ubiquitous and can be had for as little as $70 up front and $30 a month. With an estimated 182 million smartphone users in the US alone, there is an undeniable shift in how we receive information and communicate as a society. Despite the obvious shift in how we communicate, I'm still shocked by the work I see at nearly every graphic design portfolio review or senior show I attend. The usual projects are always there, stationary sets, annual reports, CD booklets, two-page magazine spreads, postcards, postage stamps, beer and wine labels, calendars, and gig or social cause posters. The work is usually well thought out with a clear hierarchy, good understanding of color and typography, but every time I see this kind of work, I silently wonder if graphic design education is failing to prepare students in a world where Hillary <coughs> Clinton has her own email server, hopefully in our living room. I, I hope I pray for that. While the core tenets of good visual design have withstood the test of time, their contextual applications have exponentially changed since 2005. And many of the students, pro student projects I currently see are now totally obsolete. It is time that design educators recontextualize the application of existing design principles into contemporary projects expected of today's design student um, entering the workforce. For example, print campaigns consisting of mailers have now been replaced by email and social media campaigns. 
Thus, teaching students what vital information should be included in a banner image at the top of an email, on a Facebook post, or on an event registration page should be the order of the day and just as important as good typography. Sure, there are a ton of new skills that should be added to the core design principles. Hierarchy, through movement, thanks to the iPhone and HTML and CSS, quickly come to mind. Thus, my current research is actually an open call to design educators to recontextualize their current pedagogy to reflect the contemporary communication systems <coughs> shaping our world today. So, thank you. sociology of health and illness. Some people will call us medical sociologists, but I feel like medical sociologists have sometimes gotten a little bit of a bad rap in the last decade or so. Um, and I think what we really do in many ways is look at health, uh, medicine, and illness. Um, and I think that's a little bit more specific. Um, so that's what I call myself. Um, in particular, I work on issues around mental health. Um, so I'm currently working on two projects that, uh, you know, there are some threads between them, but I'd say they're pretty different from one another, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, each of those projects. Um, and so the first one is a book project that really stems from my dissertation work. Um, and so um, I'm really interested in sort of the social history of psychiatry. Uh, and so my dissertation work, I did a bunch of interviews with mental health practitioners, um, mostly psychoanalysts, who uh, some of whom are trained as medical practitioners and some of whom have PhDs and are trained as psychologists. And I talked to them about what um, some people have referred to as sort of a paradigm shift in psychiatry, um, what Ed Shorter in the early 90s called um, sort of the shift from the mind into the body. Uh, and so uh, over here on the left-hand side, you have sort of the classical depiction of Freudian psychoanalysis, um, in-depth talk therapy, lots of contact with a practitioner. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, you have sort of the bio-psychiatry um, that dominates the field today. I mean, this doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the one has completely disappeared, but it's what's dominant, right? So uh, really up until the 1980s, really, when the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders was released, uh, the field was really, really dominated by uh, analysis, deep thinking, what I call meaning making. Um, and you know, now we're really seeing that uh, the little bit of psychoanalysis that does exist is really outside of psychiatry. Um, some of it's in psychology, some of it's in social work, but very few psychiatrists are really training um, <coughs> in psychoanalysis, and that has really dramatic effects on patients' lives, the kinds of treatments that people get, and sort of the dominant conceptualizations of um, you know a range of conditions. Right. So um, the work that I do, um, I really look at what's been described as medicalization and how. Um, there used to be a dramatic resistance to medicalization in psychiatry, and we've sort of moved into this era where that's largely absent, right? So um, for the most part, psychiatrists really support the use of medications. Again, I'm not saying this is good or bad. There's really great things that have come with the use of medication, um, but there are some problems associated with it um, in the sense that um, a lot of that meaning-making practice that existed pre-1980s has really disappeared from the field. Um, and it can be frustrating for patients. It's frustrating for practitioners, frankly. Um, and so, as I said, I'm working on a book project about this now, um, where I um, am using that data, um, these interviews with practitioners. Um, I think I'll talk probably just a minute longer on the second project, which um, you know is sort of what I'm really immersed in right now. Um, when I was in graduate school, I had the great opportunity to work with um, uh, Sarah Rosenfield, um, who is sort of one of the preeminent scholars on gender and mental health. Um, and uh, I didn't do that for my dissertation and I always regretted it. And sort of by um, forces of the universe, um, I was asked to write 
a chapter about men's mental health for an encyclopedia a couple of years ago. Um, and I thought this would just be a brief project and nothing would really come of it. Uh, and I wound up kind of getting together with a few other scholars in the field who were also interested in gender, particularly in men's mental health, um, and who had kind of felt the same way. They had done these little projects on gender that never really amounted to much. And all of us started to realize that there's this huge hole um, in the literature on mental health. Uh, we know a ton about women's mental health. Um, and you know, I've started to chip away some of what I see as some of the problems in the ways we talk about um, women's mental health also. But we really know nothing about men's mental health. Um, so what we're doing is sort of challenging what I call the two-thirds, one-third argument. Um, and that is basically that um, you know, two-thirds of depression and anxiety is women. Uh, and two-thirds of substance abuse and aggressive kinds of disorders uh, is men, right? Um, so, you know, uh, one, I question whether that's actually true, um, and two, um, you know, what about the one-thirds, right? So just because two-thirds of something is women or men, one-third is still a lot of people, right? Because we're diagnosing millions and millions of people with um, these kinds of psychiatric illnesses every single year. So in terms of men's mental health, um, the classic things that people have looked at, socialization, help seeking, coping, um, and so people are starting to look at measurement, so maybe we're not tapping into <coughs> men's mental health very well, and that's why we're seeing this two-thirds, one-third. Um, so I just take about a minute and tell you about the current project that I'm working on with these two wonderful people, so one from Rutgers and one from um, University of Nevada. And so what we decided to do was to think about one of the factors that might be underlying um, you know, some of uh, kind of what's going on for men, right? Um, and so, you know, what might be some of the factors that could be predicting um, depression and anxiety for men? Because if we can start to figure that out, maybe we can chip away at um, some of these bigger questions. Um, so we're a little bit limited by the data that we have, which is from the Wisconsin Longitudinal Survey, um, which is a really cool database for those of you um, who have never uh, looked at it before, and I imagine some of you are not in these kinds of fields where you'd be looking at quantitative data. I usually don't look at quantitative data myself. Um, and so the cool thing about this is it has waved since <coughs> the 1950s, right? So it actually followed every <coughs> high school graduate um, starting in the 1950s, and so um, the men in this uh, sample are now in their 70s, right? Um, and it has this really cool masculinity scale in it, and it's the <coughs> only data that we've been able to find that measures masculinity and uh, has some uh, mental health outcomes, right? Um, so we started to look at this. Um, so they have this scale, um, you know, just to give you an idea of what's on that, right? It's sort of the hegemonic masculinity is kind of the ideal traditional masculinity. Most people don't achieve it or attain it, uh, but it's kind of the things that people measure themselves against, right? So there's obviously multiple versions of masculinity, but this is, you know, sort of the dominant conceptualization. And in our preliminary analyses, what we begin to, begin to sh find um, is that as you increase in hegemonic masculinity, right? So the more masculine you are, the more depressed you are, right? And the more and the more anxious you are. Now, this really flies in the face of that sort of internalizing, right? The um, women internalize things and are depressed and anxious. Men externalize things and are substance abusers and, and aggressors, right? Because the expectation then should be um, that uh, the least masculine men should look more like the women, right? And therefore should be the most depressed. So it's opening up sort of all these kinds of questions about, you know, kind of challenging our classic assumptions about what leads to mental health problems for men and women. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> Age, you can always get sometimes get your your decision back. <laughs> okay, I might be a little bit of an outlier. Um, can I do? Is your can I borrow your? Oh, 
I might be a little bit of an outlier among you in that I'm a, trained as an ecologist. And I study migratory animals, the biology of migratory species. And what I'm going to talk to you about is to introduce their fantastic biology to you, try to convince you that they're worth conserving, and then give you a precy on some of the things that are necessary to do so. And so what you're looking at here is this amazing collection of species that traverse the globe as they move virtually across the entire ocean continents on the way from their breeding areas to their non-breeding areas and everything in between. They involve some of the most iconic species that we know about. Wildebeest in Africa, caribou in North America that go across the North Slope. If you ever watch a documentary, <coughs> you've seen wildebeest trying to evade crocodiles lying in wait, ready to get a meal. They involve pole-to-pole -pole migrations of 11,000 kilometers of birds that could sit in the palm of your hand. Insects, butterflies and moths, those butterflies that come to your doorstep in the fall, to your lights, may be on their way over oceans. In the oceans, we have massive whales, turtles, They've been inspired all sorts of fantastic art thinking. Moby Dick. <laughs> children's movies. If you have children, you know exactly who this is. <laughs> and children. This, these type of species have inspired people to have lifelong passions devoted to nature. And in fact, if this young boy stays watching birds the rest of his life, he will actually contribute to $40 billion in the economy. So in addition to inspiring art, music, <laughs> these migratory species are actually a fun very functional part of our economy. But I'm interested in them for other reasons. So I spent some time trying to understand where these things go. I track them on their migrations. And one of the projects I'm working on now is this tiny green donner dragonfly. If you go down to these sites in the Caribbean here, and you sample the wings of these animals, they give you a signature, a hydrogen signature in their wings. And it turns out that this signature varies across the continent like a contour map. And if we sample them throughout the year, we can tell where they've been. And what does this thing do? These animals that are in the Caribbean are actually flying north, as far north as the U.S. Canadian border, to breed. And each year, they return. It's a fantastic thing for something that could land on your shoulder and you wouldn't even know it was there. But many of these species aren't doing so well. So this species, the bar-tailed godwit, winters during January, February, March. It's across Australia, all over to New Zealand, regardless of where these species spend their winter, when they leave to breed in the high Arctic, nearly all of them pass through this area, the Yellow Sea region, which encompasses coastal China within that box, South Korea. And they face really poor conditions there. They're there to eat, to consume as much food as they can to fuel their migration. In 1975, this is what this area looked like. Today, it looks, whoops. Today, it looks like this. The coastline has been built out for hotels, apartments, aquaculture. So if you're a bird who is trying to come to these mud flats to get a meal, to fuel your migration, to go on and spend the winter, the summer breeding in the high Arctic, you're in a difficult place. So one of the things I was doing in my postdoc in Australia was trying to understand what the consequences of this type of habitat loss are. And if you look across all the species that fly across this area, <coughs> those species that don't rely too much on this area for feeding, their populations are doing pretty well. But the more you rely on this area, the deeper your population decline. At this level here, these species are on the brink of extinction. Both are globally threatened, and they're probably at the point of no return. On this side of the hemisphere, I spend time tracking small songbirds 
with these tiny devices that are about the size of a penny. And what you find when you track these populations is that populations from different areas of the U.S. in the southeast, the central east, you know, the midwest, and the northeast go to different places on their winter grounds. They're breeding up in the U.S. But these populations fly to Belize primarily, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. The question is, if many of these populations are declining, and this songbird is also in trouble, how do you go about making decisions <coughs> about conservation if they're going to so many different places? It involves, if nothing else, collaboration among a lot of different people. And this is where my work is headed. The biologists, me, it's our job to prioritize what to conserve. I'm increasingly starting to work with economists who tell us where we can maximize our investment. Land costs vary greatly across the world. If you're interested in conserving something, you'd like to know where your investment is going to get you the most for your money. Political scientists can help us understand if the area we're interested in is stable. Does it have, is it likely to persist if we choose to conserve land there? And sociologists can help us understand how conservation will affect local people there. There's no way to do good conservation to ensure the stability of these populations without a lot of collaboration among people. So thanks very much. Thanks to you all. And everyone kept time. So we did indeed have eight scholars in an hour. And now we have time for some questions for the final bunch, or if you've thought of for the first four. Um, I have a question for Kathy. Um, so you, I definitely see like there's like in your early work and then later you have like a very like scientific yeah. um, theme that runs through it and it's kind of like <coughs> the lab science in the early on and then it, now it's turned more towards machines and I'm wondering do you have any background in science? Is it, I mean, where does that come from? a scientist. <laughs> okay. But I don't think it was, it, it's not necessarily through her that my interest arose from it. I think it was sort of um, some of the pieces that I showed you that there were definitely a time where artists and scientists were really having big discussions. And I think that I was really involved in those discussions and thinking a lot about that integration between arts and science. Um, I definitely think that my partner, because we talk about and we were involved in you know, her, her, her work and talking about it to me, so that sort of comes out. Mm -hmm. But I think it's sort of, um, uh, a little bit of engaging in that dialogue, also through the fact that I use technology as well. Go ahead. Question for you, actually, just about one of the, the maps you showed. Um, I noticed that, if I recall correctly, populations in the southeast were making the shortest traverse to Belize, while those in the northeast were making the longest traverse to Costa Rica. Yeah. So it's that kind of thing that you would expect to mean that there. I mean, differences in selective pressures in the population. Have you noticed any evidence of that? We haven't studied those populations closely enough to right. know that, but other species who do that type of thing, yeah. absolutely. Right, yeah. Absolutely. Kind of at least uh, varieties of speciation eventually. And that's the short right. story, but it comes yeah. out in the wash in really interesting ways. Right. You don't elaborate? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, it, so really, what it, the, what it feels free, out, right? the well, longer you migrate, yeah the higher the chance you are of dying. Because it's just a hazardous affair. Right, okay. You face predators, you sure. expend all this energy. But those species that migrate for a long time tend to do this sort of boomer bust reproductive cycle. So they put a lot of energy into reproduction <laughs> and they have a lot of babies. Those who migrate short distance don't have uh -huh. as uh, so much of risk of survival. Wash. They tend to invest less in reproduction. Mm -hmm. So but right. all, when you put it all together, it kind of balances uh -huh. out. That's Pretty interesting. interesting. Right. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, speaking here as a, as, a, as a print designer and a screen-based designer, um, you know, I see and <coughs> maybe some sort of weird connection here uh, in terms of, um, you know, you've been speaking about birds and their immigration, or uh, not immigration, their migration patterns being changed, you know, by both technology but also cultural development, you know, across their, their, their breeding zones. Um, in, in terms of, and, and also this is kind of 
dragging in what you were talking about, linear B, mm -hmm. and different languages. I mean, culture is always in a constant state of change. Um, speaking as a print designer, and I think on behalf of all the scholars who are here, print is a format that we've been used to now for over, you know, a good, what, 500 years. Um, the invention of print, and I'm specifically thinking about the example of the New York Times article that you were showing. Um, and you were showing that as you were, as you were speaking. But I found myself actually more interested in what was happening on screen as opposed to what you were saying. <laughs> and I think that this is kind of a strange dilemma that I think both scholars but also designers have to think about, is that this new literacy comes with it, like a certain degree of distraction. And so how, like, I mean, as a web designer, mm -hmm. you know, how do you feel that we're going to make that jump and have it be ultimately a positive thing? That might be too big of a question, but, but I'm just curious. How Wait, say the last sentence again. <laughs> well, that um, we're constantly distracted now in our reading environments, mm -hmm. right? Um, say, for example, you know, on one hand, that the New York Times article is very elegant, right? And there mm -hmm. were all these sort of things that were germane to the topic that you could click on and sort of understand the material better. So that's a good example of it. Mm -hmm. But for every good example, I can cite you know four or five bad examples of just even being on Facebook, pop-up ads, these sort of things that you know, in the on-screen environment just become distracting, not necessarily something that enrich enriches your understanding of the material. Because right? they haven't been designed. And I, I think that's ultimately what it is, is that New York Times article had been carefully designed to, who was talking about sound? Yeah. <laughs> right. So just the way, this, this idea that we have to relearn how to deal with sound, we have to relearn how to deal with these kinds of issues. And I think it comes from the fact that we just haven't designed those experiences yet. So once designers get in there, roll up their sleeves, design these experiences, we won't have those distractions. So education sort of becomes really a big part of that role. Yeah. And information literacy. I mean, Certainly. How do you how do you discern what's what's good, what's valid? Mm -hmm. You know, not only textually but visually and auditorily. And I, I I think also too just to kind of touch up with that like the visual literacy, that's actually being taught in K through 12, this idea of visual literacy. So our students that are coming in actually do have a better understand. We may think they're distracted, but studies are kind of showing they may not be as distracted as you think because they've grown up understanding how to filter out what. So it's more different modes of literacy, not necessarily yeah. different ways of reading. Yes, potentially. Well, I think they also come in with an understanding of structure, hierarchy that we didn't see a while ago, you know, because based on my experience as a parent, you see them doing that in second, second grade on up, you know, thinking about that organization visually as well as written textbooks. <laughs> I don't know the word. And the visual is still the dominant, right? That's yeah. why it, with sound stuff, yeah. I mean, again, you teach visual literacy and, and students tend to get that right away, and it's almost like, Oh yeah, we do that all the time. And we, <coughs> we analyze that image and we understand it. But when I bring sound into it and ask them to do the same things, they have an incredibly difficult time talking oh, about wow. it. That's um, so I think because the visual has been so dominant for so long that it's you almost it's almost a retraining <coughs> about. That's See, kind of I find that 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 funny, interesting, funny from a personal approach or personal experiences mm -hmm. in that I see the visual arts so ignored, and I see uh, music. As sound so so dominant. Mm -hmm. They have an easier time talking about music with yeah. lyrics mm -hmm. because of the text, and they have that. Or even like just band and orchestra, right. and you know mm -hmm. all those. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a big field. <laughs> it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody yeah. else? Well, I invite you then to have a few refreshments, and thank you all. Thank <clears throat> you.